Good morning. Uh, welcome again to another uh, edition of Around the World with Dane Waters. You know, these shows, you know, when we first started this show, we always talk about, and I say this every week, I really do, you know, what is the reason for this show? Why do we do it? What's going on? And I try to say every week that it's important for us to understand what's happening around the world because we're in global conflict. I mean, and I say this every every week as well, you know, people who are in Nigeria or Tanzania or in, in you know South Africa or even in Birmingham, Alabama, where I'm from, or Arkansas, where our guest is from, I mean, a lot of people in these areas, they just think, like, why do we care about these things? But we are heading toward, I, unfortunately, I believe, global conflict. So let's look at what's going on here for a second. You know, we have... Um, what they call a minor incursion into Lebanon by the Israelis. Listen, the Israelis are not going to stop. The Israelis, this minor incursion is going to turn into a major incursion. Uh, the Israelis are emboldened. Uh, you know, they, they, they've been assassinating everybody that they can. And I'm not passing judgment one way or the other, but we have to look at the fact about what's going on. You know, the Middle East is, uh, is, is the level of instability in the Middle East is growing. I do believe, my prediction is, is that the Israelis are going to possibly try to assassinate some Iranian leaders, you know, maybe Khomeini himself. You know, we have to look at the possibility and what would that do to a region. We'll talk about that here in a second. Uh, we talk about what, of course, we always talk about what's happening in Russia and Ukraine. Then we talk about what's happening in the United States with the presidential election. And then, you know, one of the big topics we'll talk about is, you know, China is just now celebrating their 75th anniversary of communism, as if we all thought communism was dead. But no, they still pretend that their communism is alive and well. And, you know, and, and the rhetoric by them about Taiwan and what's going to happen in the South China Sea in that area. So there's so much. So, so to the listeners, to the watchers, what does this mean to you? What it really means, and I, and I can't emphasize this enough, is that we can no longer just sit in our rooms and sit in our bedrooms and sit in our living rooms and watch, you know, uh, Dallas Callis cheer, cheerleaders or, or, you know, uh, desperate housewives or whatever we do. We must focus on what's going around the world because each and every one of us will be impacted. We think COVID impacted our lives in very many ways. Global conflict and the conflict that's happening is going to impact us more so than anything we've ever seen. So anyway, that's my initial monologue. We're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to be joined by Paul Jacob, who's going to be here to talk to us about these global uh, affairs and also what the U.S. involvement in these issues. Uh, we're very honored today to have with us as a guest, a global affairs expert, Paul Jacob. Paul and I have known each other, I don't know, Paul, how long? 30 years? 35 years? Yeah, I don't know. Well, we're not that old, but if we were that old, it would be 30 plus years. Yes, I mean it's it's uh, we were we were mere children when we met, and we were on the playground playing together. I think that's what it was. But but I'm from Alabama, Paul's from Arkansas, and he'll let you guys decide which is the better state. But uh, but Paul and I have worked together on issues around the world. Uh, Paul is uh, I cut my teeth on direct democracy issues, initiative and referendum. Paul taught, taught me everything I know about that issue, so I'm eternally grateful for that. His reward is he gets to be on this show. That's how I'm rewarding you these days, you know, Paul. Uh, um, I get to but go was, around Dane Waters. That's uh, that's right. What? Because, because five years ago, on this very day, you and I were together in Taiwan. Oh, really? On the Taiwan democracy train. Well, how fortuitous! See, I knew that when I when I decided to have you on the show, I just knew that was the case. What do I know? By the way, in the background, <laughs> you guys will see the 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 whale, and that's uh, the Taiwan flag up behind Paul's. Uh, um, I think he stole that, by the way. So I think the Taiwanese police are still looking for you in some way. But listen, we have a lot to talk about, and uh, in all seriousness, I know that uh, we, we joke about whenever I see you, we joke about these things, we talk seriously about these things. But you know, we need to. We really need to start figuring out um, what's going on, and and so let me just ask you. I'm going to throw you some some curveballs. You know, you're you know, you know, just to see what happens. Uh, well, first I've of never all, never hit a curveball, but I'll try. Okay. Well, first of all, let's let's just start with a simple question. Uh, your prediction. I know it's not what we're supposed to talk about, but what is your prediction about the U.S. presidential election? I'm just curious to hear. You know, I it's very tough to make a prediction. I get I get asked that all the time. Um, if the election were held today, I think Kamala Harris, uh, uh, Kamala Harris wins. Uh, but I'm I'm not sure what happens on election day, and it's it's difficult. You know, it, it it's interesting to me that I think almost none of the U.S. you know uh, presidential election will be decided on foreign policy, and 
I really liked what you said in your opening monologue. And one of the things that has disturbed me is that around the world, folks are getting ready. Japan's doubling their, you know, their defense spending. Uh, NATO, I think, has stepped up in ways that most Americans would have been doubtful they would step up years ago uh, in, in response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, there's, there is, uh, there have been things on, on uh, mini series on Chinese television. There's one coming up on Taiwanese television about a possible invasion. And it seems like the United States is asleep at the switch. It reminds me of Humphrey Bogart in Casablanca saying, I'll bet they're all asleep in New York. And, you know, with the ominous uh, idea that America's asleep because it doesn't realize a world war is happening. And, you know, sometimes you feel kind of like a crotchety old man that, uh, that oh, the world is, is going to hell, you know. Um, but there are some serious, serious problems. And, and to get back to the presidential election, which is the question you asked me, uh, I think that if you vote on the economy, the economy during Trump was pretty good until COVID, and then it went into the toilet, and, uh, and it's yet to bounce back. There's been a bunch of inflation. Uh, so on some of the biggest issues, Trump is leading uh, in terms of, you know, the, the voters would rather have him deal with that issue. Um, and, and so I think, I think in, in that way, you would expect uh, the opponent of the sitting regime, that uh, regime, you know, uh, administration is going to do well. But Trump is just such a wild card that you have no idea. I mean, this is, this is a man who has greater than 50% negatives uh, and has still been elected and very, very close in 2020. And it, no question is either going to win or, or lose very close in 2024. Well, you know, the, the reason I ask about that is because, you know, the one thing that we're going to talk about today, the thing, you know, we have, you know, as you say, the world is adrift, uh, you know, and who is there to help try to end that, I'm going to say driftness. I don't know if that's probably a word, probably not. It is now. Uh, yeah. It is now. It's a Danism. We'll call it a Danism. So, um, you know, and the American presidency, you know, the American president typically has a very strong uh, impact on what's happening around the world, especially with our, who we consider our allies and call our allies, whether they're United Kingdom or Israel or, you know, Ukraine or, you know, whoever it may be. And, and I think that, you know, given the uncertainty of the presidential election um, and given what's going on, uh, does America still have any clout? I mean, look at Israel. I mean, you know, every single day on the news we hear Blinken is working, the Secretary of State Blinken is working around the clock to try to, you know, bring a truce. You know, you have Biden saying enough is enough is enough. Yet, maybe Netanyahu doesn't do anything. Do you think, do you think America should take a more active role in trying to restrain Israel? Do you think that, you know, do you think that we have lost our clout? Do you think the fact that Biden is a lame duck is, is, is impacting what's happening around the world? Well, I, first of all, um, uh, I was uh, at a uh, brunch on Sunday and someone who I didn't know that well looked at me and said, can you tell me why Biden is still president? And I mean, if we're the leader of the free world and our president is, you know, certainly our commander, we have a caretaker president now. We have a uh, hey, we'll we'll get back to you. Go on fishing, President. And I, I don't say that to be negative to to Mr. Biden. I mean, we all look. Life is followed by death at some point, and our bodies don't, you know, don't last forever. So it's not a, a hit on Joe Biden, but the idea that we have a president who we all recognize, including Joe Biden is not really up to the job. He's certainly not up to the job of running for re-election. And, and it just, I, I think i think the world has had our last couple of presidents, and I'm very afraid no matter who wins in November, we'll look at our next president as not someone they would instinctively say, hey, that's the leader of the free world. And so that that's a, that's a problem. Well, let's ask this question. So what is, so in your opinion, what is the role or what should be the role of the United States in global affairs? 
Well, um, I should I should preface this as as you know, Dane. Uh, I've been what would be called a non-interventionist for pretty much my whole life, and I consider myself still a non-interventionist. We're not looking, or at least the United States should not be looking to mess around in different places where we're not wanted. Um, the thing that has struck me uh, in in recent years is that we are very much wanted. You know, the 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 people in Taiwan really like us. Uh, the people in Ukraine really like us. And countries like Vietnam want to be friends with us. Now, it may not be just because of our, our winning personalities. It may be because we have some military clout. But that's that's where we are in the world, is that without the United States and our military, uh, you know, nobody else has 11 aircraft carriers. And it seems like we have told the world for my entire lifetime, I was born in 1960, 15 years after the end of World War II, we have told the world, hey, hold my beer, I've got this. And, and in essence, haven't really encouraged other countries to play the kind of role that I'd like to see in the future. The days of the United States policing the world as the lone superpower are over. I, I've never liked that term superpower. I think it's hubris. Uh, I don't think the U.S. is a superpower. I don't think China is a superpower. Now, both of them are stronger militarily than other countries, but just I just really don't like the, the term superpower because we start to think we can do everything. You know, if we can put a man on the moon, then we can do anything. That's not how the world works. And so I'm, I want the U.S. to step up and do what we have said we're going to do. But in the process, I'm hoping that we will build an alliance of free countries. And I think the, the a true alliance where there's real burden sharing. And uh, because I think one, that's the only way to stop China and to stop Russia. And, and two, I don't think we're up to policing the whole world and doing it all by ourselves. And, and one of the most exciting things in recent years is to see uh, NATO stepping up more and Japan stepping up and, and different, uh, you know, you've got Japan and South Korea and Japan and the Philippines making deals with each other like buddies. They haven't been buddies. Uh, they're only buddies right now because they're all scared to death of China. We're going to come back to China and Taiwan, you know, after the break. But one thing that, you know, you know, people are wondering, well, why am I having this conversation when everything's going on between Israel and Lebanon? I mean, listen, you know, if you look at if you look at where we are with Israel, if you look at what's happening in the Middle East, you know, uh, it a lot of it has to do with the fact of America, in my opinion, to go back to what you're talking about, has been an absentee landlord when it comes to the Middle East. You know, you, know, you have Iran. You know, we, you know, we, you know, one people people can argue about whether getting out of the the agreement with Iran, the Iran nuclear deal, was the right thing or wrong thing. <clears throat> but the reality is, the more you embolden Iran, the more its proxies, Hezbollah, Hamas, have in, have been empowered. The reason we are where we are in in the Middle East is because you know I would say America has not properly uh, dealt with the Palestinian issue. Uh, we, you know, have, you know, I know that when Trump was president, he was working on the Abraham Accords, which was in a way to try to to better relations between the Arab world and, and, and Israel. And it was it started to take off, you know, the KSA or the Saudi Arabia was kind of the holdout. But this left a vacuum where, where the Palestinian statehood issue was put on the back burner. Now that very practically speaking, what is what led to Hamas acting the way it did. That's just the reality of it. And and now uh, because of Bibi Netanyahu, Prime Minister Netanyahu is, 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 was having own political troubles at home. Now he is trying, in my opinion, to rebuild his credibility by taking on the what I would call the axis of evil against Israel, which is Iran, Hezbollah, Hamas. The Houthis, you know, they're, they're out there, but they're not a major threat. And so we are where we are today uh, because of, of the lack of the United Nations. I mean, you, you think that, you know, Lebanon, let's talk about this for a second. Lebanon right. uh, is a very important um, uh, country to the French, but the French have not done anything. Macron went there after the the the, the uh, bombing at the port, but nothing's happened since then. So the question is, you know, we have the ground incursion, uh, and my prediction, I mean, let me just say this for, for, the, for the viewers. 
why did they invade? UN Resolution 1701 says, um, and we're going to talk about the UN after the break as well. UN Resolution 1701 said that, uh, that the, the Latani is in Lebanon. Between the Latani River and the Israeli border should be demilitarized, similar to what we have in between North and South you know, um, uh, Korea. Uh, however, ever since that resolution came into place after the 2006 invasion, um, there has been no truth. You know, the, the Hezbollah has been in that area. They've been shooting rockets in that area. And so the belief is, is that, and because of that, 60,000 Israelis have had to leave their home on the, on, on the Israeli side. So the Israelis say that we want to basically enforce what's happening, uh, the UN Resolution 1701, and push Hezbollah past the Latani River, and then that way our people can come back um, into their settlements. Now, the reality is, and, and, and the way they did that, I mean, they, they, they've assassinated every, every leader of Hezbollah. They will continue to assassinate every he leader of Hezbollah. Uh, but the last two major wars between Lebanon and Israel has basically ended up in a draw. Now, I think Israel has the upper hand here. But the reality, you know, the killing of Nasrallah, I mean, you know, that was a major thing. And that has really boosted uh, Netanyahu's uh, opinion rating. So, so all of this is happening. You know, and and I, I tell you, as an American, you know, I lived I lived in Lebanon for full disclosure. I've lived in Lebanon. I've worked in the region. I worked against Hezbollah. I've done all that kind of stuff. I think a lot could have happened more if the United Nations, I mean, the United States took a more active role. But the reality is, where we are now, I mean, do you see in your prediction? Uh, and I'm asking you to make a very specific prediction. What do you think is going to happen in, in between Israel and Lebanon? Is it going to be a, a protracted war? Is it going to be a short war? I mean, and and I'll ask you once again: Where does the United States fall into that? Well, I I, I think it's more likely to be a short war in the sense that I think Hezbollah is on its heels. It's it's not just you know killing the leader. It's also that the the pagers and cell phones and you know, I, I think they're they're certainly on their heels. So uh, I think Israel has enough of the upper hand that they're likely to to push Hezbollah back, uh, you know, fairly quickly. But in in terms of the U.S. role, we have the right in in Ukraine. You know, we have a right to say no. We we're not going to fund that. We have a right to say, hey, here's what we think we you should do. Uh, we have the same right in Israel to say, look, we're not we're not going to help if this is what you're doing. So I'm I'm not against us. You know, I, you don't want to micromanage, but I'm not against the U.S. asserting its rights, because if we're paying, if we're putting our own uh, soldiers in the Middle East in in harm's way. And and trust me, as we're sending thousands more troops to the Middle East, you know, recently. <laughs> Uh, Kamala Harris said, you know, we don't have anybody in, in a combat situation in the world. I was thinking, you need, to, you need to wake up and open the drapes and look out because we've got a lot of people in harm's way. So we have every right to put pressure on folks. But I, I do have to say that I think, I think U.S. politics and the fact that it's no longer true that our disagreements end at the border, at the water's edge. Um, we, you know, what's happened in Ukraine with, with Trump, uh, that's not the way you want it to play out. And right now, what's happening, I think, with Israel, in that there's fear in the Biden administration if they are too supportive of Israel or if they're not supportive enough. And of course, what you have to do as a leader is put all that aside and do the right thing. But uh, I think a lot of American voters are not so sure we, we've seen any presidential candidates or presidents in recent times who will put everything else aside except doing the right thing. So so that's that's kind of uh, I think I think you can't expect that Hamas attacks and then Israel doesn't do anything, you, you, you know, or or does a little bit of something and then says, hey, ceasefire. Hezbollah, there was a New York Times headline I saw. Uh, yesterday, I think it was that that you know Hezbollah just wanted a limited war. Well, the problem with wars is that they're not very much limited, and uh, and so you know, I think I think we have every right to say look in responding. I mean, if I were president, I would I would support Israel's response, but I would also say we're going to support to this degree, and I want some influence, or we're not gonna we're not gonna be there with all the supplies and other things and 
And frankly, I think Israel is a pretty uh, formidable force without U.S. backing. But I think they I think they want that backing. And there's nothing wrong with us leveraging all of our support. But I think we have to do it in a in a bipartisan way politically here in this country. And I think we have to recognize that when when you have an ally and they're engaged in deadly combat, that you don't want to second guess in the newspapers and you don't want to be you know, you don't want to be a backseat driver. You want to set clear parameters that this is what we're willing to support and this is what we're not. I'm going to change gears over to 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 China and Taiwan. It's an area that you care a lot about, and I care a lot about as well. You know, so to you know, uh, this is the 75th anniversary of of Chinese uh, communism. And I know the president of China made a speech yesterday where he was talking about uh, Taiwan and you know, the role of Taiwan. So, what do you, what is your prediction about what's going to happen in in the South China Sea area with with China and Taiwan? Well, I'm convinced that China is convinced that the United States and the West is weak. And they have drawn a line, including all of the South China Sea in it. And they, I mean, they basically claim 90% of the South China Sea. They have, uh, you know, if you look at where these battles are over an island, you know, the Spratleys or the Paracel or whatever. And of course, yesterday there was a report that, that uh, 10 Vietnamese fishermen were uh, beaten up and three of them had broken limbs in some fight near the Paracel Islands. And they, it wasn't said what country was involved, you know, the fishermen from what country or the, or the people from what country, you know, hurt the, these uh, Vietnamese fishermen. But I had my suspicions because they've rammed Vietnamese ships, they've rammed Filipino uh, uh, vessels. Um, they're going to continue. They have claimed this entire ocean for the most part, 90% plus. And they're policing it now. And they've, they've said that. It's not like they've hidden that they claim the entire ocean. They're very bold about it. And they say they're going to police it. The rest of the world has to stand up. And when you think about protecting the Philippines, which the U.S. has a treaty with, when you think about Japan, which we also have a defense treaty with, and you think about Taiwan, where we don't quite have a treaty. We have an old one that we kind of walked away from, but we do have the Taiwan Relations Act, where we have said we're going to give them whatever they need not to be taken by force. And you've got China constantly saying we're going to take it by force. We have to stand up. Um, and, and we, you know, it's not just Taiwan. It's also the Philippines. It's also other places in the South China Sea. It's also islands around Japan where China is regularly uh, incurring into, uh, uh, you know, making minor incursions into uh, Japanese territory. So, you know, and if you look at a map, you will see that Taiwan is in the middle of the Philippines and the and Japan. And if we're going to defend those two countries, even not defending Taiwan, it sure helps if Taiwan is a free country and not part of, of a communist uh, China. So, so I look at that area of the world, when I think of Russia, they're a danger, uh, but not the same danger that China is. Russia economically is one-tenth the size of China. And so I think you know, we have to be very serious. And I think we have to stand up because they will keep pushing until we do. And uh, and I, I saw a video the other day where someone went through some of the different border, you know, what the what the nine dash or now the new 10 dash line means, what the new map that China drew means. And they just went country after country where there have been border disputes. And a lot of people are aware of the border disputes with India. There have been people killed in recent years in those disputes, but they're not aware that China is stealing land from Nepal and that it's taken land from Bhutan. And it, you just go on and on. There's not a neighbor that it is not aggressing against. And, uh, and so, you know, I don't think that there's any choice we either are there as sitting ducks 
for China to continue to push until something escalates, or we begin to push back. And I, I was excited to see a, a German uh, warship go through the Taiwan Strait uh, last week, two weeks ago. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to see Australia and Japan and South Korea and other countries, the Philippines, getting a lot more serious about their defense. Taiwan's uh, nearly doubled their defense in the last eight years, their defense spending. Um, so that's happening. Uh, but, you know, the United States is the indispensable part of all that. And if we don't stand up for Taiwan, Japan's not going to have any trust that will stand up for them. The Philippines aren't going to have any trust. And again, it's not just about us standing up for them. This is such a tiny planet. And it's about all of us standing up for each other. I don't think once upon a time the U.S. could do what it wanted. I was never a big fan of, hey, get permission from the U.N. because I've always viewed the U.N. as a less than credible uh, body with a lot of corruption swirling around it. And and so, you know, I, I, I've never been a big fan of, oh, the U.S. has to go to, to the U.N. But the U.S. at this point does need the rest of the world, the free world, to step up. And the nice thing is the rest of the free world appears to be stepping up. We just have to get our act together and and begin to get stronger and stronger. And, and you see some of that turning around in, in recent years, Dane. Uh, you know, certainly we've recognized the China threat that we hadn't recognized uh, just a few years ago. But a lot more needs to be done. Let's just wrap it up and just figure out and tell me what is the future of the world in, in your in your eyes, whether it's whether it's Israel, whether it's Lebanon, whether it's Russia, Ukraine, whether it's China and Taiwan, what is your prediction in the next five years where we're going to be? Well, you know, just think about, uh, and, and you know, World War II seems so distant, but historically it's, it's not so distant. Think about what would have happened if the Germans won and the Japanese won. Uh, and you think of both of those countries, you know, I've always remarked how how easy it was for the German people and the Japanese people to embrace freedom and democracy and peace. Uh, the problem wasn't the people, just as the problem is not the Russian people and the Chinese people or the Iranian people who voted for democratic leaders again and again only to be rebuffed. Um, the, the, the problem is authoritarianism will continue to roll unless it's stopped. And I think we are at a similar point to World War II. Uh, we are headed to World War III. Some people, if, if, if things head badly, they may say we're already in it. Maybe it started when Ukraine, uh, when Russia invaded Ukraine. These, but, but we are, I think, in the next 10 years in a situation where we're going to, it's a, it's a watershed. We're going to see authoritarianism triumph where we're going to see it push back and the world will have another 10, 20, 30, 50 years, let's hope even more, of greater productivity. Um, I mean, think of the, you know, people can get their, their goods to market now without a lot of harassment because the free world has oceans that are freely nav navigable. I uh, got that word out. And, and, you know, we will lose some of that. So it, so really we have a choice between a world uh, that is ugly and totalitarian. You know, we call it authoritarian. Uh, but if you look at communist China, it's not authoritarian. It's all the way to totalitarian. And, uh, and so we're going to have that world or, we're going, or the free world's going to survive. And, uh, and either way you slice it. I think we're in for a lot of pain and suffering and sacrifice uh, that will all be worth it if we can keep the world more free. Well, listen, Paul, I really appreciate the time. It's always great chatting with you. Uh, we are exactly at the time we need to stop. So sorry for the technical glitches today, but, you know, hey, we're from Alabama and Arkansas. We, we're used to these kind of things, not you know, not working properly. So anyway, <laughs> thanks, thanks everybody. 
Yes, I think I'm from Mississippi. That's very true what we like to say. Uh, listen, uh, thanks to all of you for watching today. Appreciate it. Uh, we'll return next week with Around the World with Dane Waters. We'll uh, hope to have uh, the former Prime Minister of Ukraine, Vladimir Grossman, as our guest. And uh, we'll talk soon. Thanks a lot and have a great day.